Thanks. Um, so there we go right there. The most important things I've learned about good design. So my name is Mark Miller. That's me right there. In case you're uh, far away, you can see me up close. Um, my email address, my Twitter account is there. I have a second Twitter account, Great UI, at Great UI, uh, where I talk about UI issues as well and answer UI questions. I've been writing, um, whoops, I've been writing developer productivity tools for uh, over 30 years. So my focus, the only thing I've been doing, is writing tools for making developers write code faster. That's what my focus has been. Um, for about the last 16 years, I've been focused on great design and UI and UX. And uh, I'm currently chief scientist for the IDE tools at Developer Express. And uh, Code Rush is one of the products I've been working on for uh, about the last 10 years. It's a tool that sits inside of Visual Studio. So we're going to talk about the most important things. And um, when I was invited to this conference, they, I, I was initially uh, excited and saying, okay, well, I can do this talk and this talk and this talk. And they're like, we only want one. And I'm like, okay, I guess I can do everything in one. And they're like, it's only 45 minutes. And I was like, oh, okay, I think I can get everything in 45 minutes. And like five minutes of that is for questions. So what I've done is I've taken what I think is the very most important things, but also I've taken the shortest way to show those things to you as well. So we're going to skip by it, and we're going to skip through each one of these, jump into each one, and uh, and talk about why they're important, uh, and and give demonstrations about how they're important. And we'll look at all of these. One of the things that's kind of cool about this is a couple of these, like fill in corners. You can see mistakes that people are making all over the place, right? Mistakes you might be making in your code, mistakes large companies are making, right? They're not doing it correctly. Okay. Chapter one, emphasis, emphasis and importance. So um, this slide right here is actually from a talk I gave to kids on the science of great user interfaces. And these are some uh, superheroes I know things about. I included it in here because I thought it was such a great way to show the concept of this. So superheroes I know something about. I know their powers, I know their secret identities, and I know their chances of beating me in a battle. So let's organize what we know. I'll put columns here for the different things I know about them. And then, for example, Batgirl, her main power is martial arts. Her secret identity is Barbara Gordon. And her chances of beating me in a fight, 100%. The Hulk, main power is the Hulk smash. Secret identity is Bruce Banner. Chances of beating me in a fight are 50%. If I catch him as Bruce Banner right behind the head with a two by four, boom, like that, I got him, I win, right? No? Okay. And then these are the others. So we organize the information, we put it in a table, and the question now that I've been posing in front of you is, can you separate this presentation into two groups of information? One group that's important information, and a second group that's less important, right? How do we take this and separate it into two different levels of importance, right? And if you look at it, some of you might be thinking, well, chances of beating Mark in a fight, that's not very important, right? Or you might think the, the headers at the top are not very important. But the concept that this table illustrates is that everything in the presentation, everything on screen is information. So if you're thinking about anything with the words and trying to divide the words up into, into different levels of importance, you're missing something. Right? Here's how I would break them into high importance and low importance groups. Right? The lines, they're not as important as the data. Right? Let's take a look at this up close. We look right in here. We zoom in, and we zoom in one more time. You can see that the thickness of the lines and the thickness of the strokes of the font are both the same width, right? The thicknesses are the same, and also the color 
of the font and the color of the lines is exactly the same. It's a high contrast black on white. So the emphasis for these two different pieces of information, low importance and high importance, is different. Now, sometimes when I'm playing around with ideas, I play, I experiment, right? So for example, I might change things around a bit. I might say, let's take the lines and make them thick and high contrast, and let's take the text and lower its contrast. And I look at it. And then I say, well, let's do the opposite. And I look at it. And then I ask myself the question, which of these is easier to read? Right? How many people think the one on the bottom is easiest to read? Okay, everybody's raising their hand, so I'm going to agree with you due to peer pressure and my inability to make any decisions on my own. And I will say, you're right. It's the best one. It's easiest to read. In this one, the emphasis matches the importance. And you may be noticing there's a small, subtle thing I've done on this slot, on this, and I've taken the headers and I've dropped down their contrast just a bit. Right? Just a bit, because once you know what the header column is, you know it, you don't need to go back and look at it again and again. The most important piece is the data in here. And this illustrates a very, very important guideline that is violated all the time, still today, by major, major software applications coming from major companies. Right? Emphasis needs to match the element's importance. Okay? That's guideline number one. Um, speaking of emphasis, I just threw this up here real quickly. These are some ways that you can make things appear to be more important. So if the information is more important, you want to make it appear more important as well. If I have important information, it should appear important. Okay? Playing a game with my kids and they roll the dice and I'm like, I have no idea what you just rolled. And the reason why is because the important information is low contrast. Right? It should be like this. Right? This is a mistake in something new that I, uh, we just bought, a game, I think, Yahtzee. So that's a design flaw right there. All right, chapter two, contrast and readability. The question is, at the top it has some text. Does this text seem hard to read? And on the bottom, there's text that asks the question, does this text seem easy to read? And watch what happens when I take the saturation out of this. The text at the top is, looks almost like it's disappeared, right? It goes straight to uh, gray on gray. The point of this is, by the way, if you agree, I guess I, had to, I, should, uh, I feel responsible that I should go back. Does everybody agree that the one on bottom? How many people agree that the one on bottom is easier to read than the one on top? Okay, again, it's overwhelming, right? So if that's the case, right, then, the, then the, what this means is, is that What's important for readability is the contrast, not between colors, but between the, the, tag, between the text and the background on the perceived brightness spectrum, in other words, grayscale. The contrast on, on a grayscale is what's important for readability. This is super important, like if you've got a path to get money from the customer, a critical customer path, like you want them to register or sign up, or you want them to give you, them your money, you want to get their money, right? You want to make things easy to read as we move forward through that path, right? So it's, so it's easy to follow. Proximity and layout. So, these are slides from the course I made for kids, but again, it's, I think, brings the concept, it's easy to understand. I've got a picture of some dogs right here. I'm going to put them up over in this corner. Um, I'm going to bring another picture of dogs. Does it feel like I should put these over here near these other ones? Does anybody feel like they should go close together? I've got one thumbs up right there. I'll take it. It's like an auction. Anybody else? Um, I'm going to bring another one. I've got two puppies. Do they feel like they should come over here? Anybody feel better about that? I feel better about that too. Okay, now I'm going to bring up another picture. That's a cat. Does that feel like this cat should go here? Some of you might say, yes, let's put the cat there, right? But I think a lot of people might think, okay, let's put it over here. It feels better. It's, it's inherently not the same, right? And then if I have a picture of a house right here, I could move it with the puppies, but it doesn't feel right. I could move it over with the cat, and then it doesn't feel right, but then I can move it in the center. 
right? And now I have something that feels right, right? And what I've done is I've taken the friends, the things that are closely related contextually, and I've put them next to each other. I've put the, taken the enemies, things with maybe potential side effects, and I've put them farther away from each other. And I put the things that are neither kind of right in the middle. It's an overall good guideline. This guideline, by the way, is broken all the time. For example, which button do I press to get to the 30th floor? Right? One of the floors opens the gates to hell. <laughs> Just want to put some consequences, right? Which button? You might be thinking, Mark, that's not fair. I want to see more, right? So here's more. Right? So one of these labels is a friend to one of the buttons on either side. Right? And it's an enemy to the other button. And yet it's right in the middle. And I call this a proximity violation. It's a violation of the proximity guidelines. Okay? Here's another example. I want to go to Fort Worth. Which way do I go? Right? Well, the answer is right, but it's not clear. Here's one of the fixes. One of the, right, here's the original. And now the, one of the fixes is let's move the friends together. Right? Here's another fix right here. I could do it this way too. I could separate with color, right? Separate with a line. I can use other things to communicate clearly to the brain that these belong together. My favorite out of all of these is the one in the upper left because it's, it's, uh, you can stack them all the way up. It uses existing technology. I don't need to recreate sign-making machines that can do lines or different colors, right? It's two colors. That's, that's my favorite. So there's a comparison of the original and our fix. By the way, remember this slide because I'm going to talk about something that's going on in this slide a little later. All right. Borders and spacing. So that's my text. I want to put a border around it, right? The question is, how close should the border be? How close can the border be? Well, I think we, a lot of us would agree. How many would agree this is too far? OK. And how many would agree that's probably too close? All right, so this is awesome. We know the answer lies right between these two. Right? We're getting very close. So after a lot of thought, and, 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 and I'm basically skipping to the answer. I'm not going to explain exactly how I got here. But this is, this is coming from me. But it's, it is, uh, unfortunately, I have no other source. But after a lot of thought and also research into the way the eye works and the way the brain reads text, okay, I've come up with this rule. You take the width of a space, you multiply it by one and a half, and then you add that to the ends. And that's your side borders. And your top borders uh, are the same, like that. And that's the rule for how close you can get if the border is the same thickness as the font stroke and the same contrast as the font stroke. If you get it closer, it interferes with the way we read. It interferes with the way we're able to see, is that border part of a character or is it a border? It's harder to tell, and it slows us down. Slows us down. Now, one way we can get in tighter is if we lower the contrast to the border. This is kind of a big deal, right? Because a lot of times we're working on a constrained, smaller space. So lower the, lower the contrast to the border. Um, you can also make the border thinner as well. OK? So the guideline here is that borders should be thin and or low contrast, and in general, no closer than one and a half times the space width, OK? So out of these, I've got two right here. How many prefer this one over here on this side? OK. You guys can switch arms if you want to exercise. You want to bulk up and build muscles on both. OK, I've got two more. Which, how many prefer, prefer this one? OK. So we're going to keep that one. And I've got two more. How many prefer this one still? OK, we still got everybody over here. All right, comparing the first with the original, right? There's an example, side by side. Thick borders, thin borders. By the way, if you want to hide information, make it hard for people to read it, this is the one you want, right? It's perfect for deception. Okay, 
Here's a call-out example. And I've actually seen this, I've seen this in the, in the wild, in real life. This call-out right here like this, right? That's not what you want. You want this one over here, okay? All right. Fill in corners. This is also some cool research. So I've got two buttons right up here. One's, one's uh, not filled and one is filled on the side. And, uh, you know, I just want to, I feel like there might be something wrong with the mic. I'd just like a sound guy to come up and check me for a second, make sure that's okay still. So I've got hollow on the left, filled on the right, and uh, I just want to go through and talk about some things, some characteristics of these. So if I look at how many pixels are visible in this button on the left, I get about 1,000. 1,000 pixels are visible, not including the text, all right? And over here, we've got about 10,000, about 10 times as many pixels are visible. Okay. Shapes to process, what's that? I have two here, and when I say that, I mean we've got an outer rectangular shape and an inner rectangular shape. That's one way that we can look at that and understand that. And over here, we've just got one shape to process. Another way of looking at it is number of corners. And here we've got eight corners, because we've got inside and outside corners. And our brain is actually processing that. This is happening in a background ta uh, task, but it's, but it's happening. And I see maybe sound guys coming nearby. Am I okay? I guess is the question. It sounds okay? Okay. I just felt like maybe something moved. I thought I was maybe in trouble. It sounds like I'm okay. So I've got eight corners over here. And on this side, I've got only four. Perfect. There we go. Now I'm a machine. I'm a cyborg. Now, peripheral image. What happens when I'm looking off to the side? Right? Click me looks like this. This one, the fill button, looks like this. This is important if I'm looking off to the side and I want to find something quickly, right? Can I see it or not? If it's an important button, that may make a difference. And then the graphical message here is that the border is important. The graphical message here is that the button is important. So all of these are small things individually. However, they make the argument that filled buttons are better than hollow buttons, okay? All right, sharp versus rounded symbols. I've got two small stars up here. Right? Do you see these two right here? How many people think the uh, red star looks bigger? Does the red star look bigger? Okay, I'm seeing just about everybody raise their hands again. Um, I would agree with you, it does look bigger. If we zoom in on them, um, you can see what's going on here. The, the star has 34%, they're almost 35% more pixels in it. It looks bigger, and when it's scaled down, it looks bigger, even though they both take up the exact same amount of space in terms of they both fit in the same square. Okay? And, and so when we're talking about like icons that are going to be small, rounded corners are better than sharp corners. Okay? So, and it's especially important when we're talking about scalability because we might design something that looks like this and then we scale it down and not realize it's much smaller. And then salience, sharp versus curved. So the idea here is the question here is what feels most important about this image? Is it this round circle in the back? Is it these curves on the inside? Or is it this point right here? And you're probably thinking it's that point right there. Okay? In fact, instead of assuming that, let's see if you agree. How many people think it's the back curve? How many people think it's the inside curve? Okay, a couple people say that. And how many people think it's this point at the end? Okay, so again, a lot of people raising their hands. Right? So it's the point at the end. What's going on, it's called, it's, um, uh, the salience is when we give importance to something, where our brain thinks that's important. So what's happening here is we're saying, oh, that's the thing that we feel is important. The sharper the corner is, the more important we think it is. Okay? So, uh, with regards to the fill example, we should do the one on the right. With example of corners, we should also do the one on the right. Right? Because corners are salient. Even though those are 90 degree angles, they still have some salience to them. The corners are not important. The corners should be rounded. Okay? And then here, for example, the one on the left we should not do, and the one on the right we should. Right? Here we have a graphical element with unimportant corners and one very important corner. The corner that points to the thing you're talking about. This is the right way to do uh, a call out. By the way, with these slides, this one and the ones before, I want you to think about this. Remember this one, too. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. 
information dimension, serial versus parallel. So serial, I'll explain that to you. Serial takes longer to consume. It takes more time. Comparisons are hard to make. There's a burden on your memory, right? You have to remember what happened before or what was behind the dialogue to work with the piece in front, right? There are pacing issues, right? If you want me to talk slower or faster, you have no control because this information is coming in serial to you. There's pacing issues. Whereas if you have a book or a website, you can just go through it as fast as you want. Harder to understand, serial. So that's serial. Let's compare that with information in parallel and I'll let you read this. And I want to ask a question. How many people found themselves eyes moving back and forth between these two? Right. Most of you are raising your hands again. Right. That is one of the benefits of information in parallel. Comparisons are instantaneous. You control the pace of the absorption of the information. Right? Boom, 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 boom. And I got it. And all those slides I called attention to on the way up, they were examples of information in parallel. Here's the original, here's the fix. Don't do this, do this instead. Information in parallel. Much better than saying don't do this, and then blank and a new slide, and do this instead. Right? Discoverability. This is a nice example of discoverability. Um, this is from an iPhone, and um, it basically explains what the controls do with these lower contrast descriptions, right? The emphasis is lower. Contrast is one of the ways we, we can emphasize. But we can also emphasize with size, right? Notice the size of these is smaller than, than the text for the controls, right? So the discoverability information is important, but it's not as important as the rest, as the controls. So this is a good example. I was flying on a plane and I saw this. And I put these up side by side, information in parallel, for uh, you to take a look at, right? This sign on the right is saying, hey, if you want to throw trash away, put it in the trash, right? Push that right there, and that's how you do it. Right? Good on the left, bad on the right. I think in the same bathroom, I see this, and it's a button. And I'm like, okay. And about a year later, I'm in the same bathroom on the same airplane, and I see this. What's happened? Well, customers were having trouble finding the flush button, right? They were f having trouble finding the flush button. I've got to understand how this works. I think I got it now. I think I've got it. All right. They're finding it. So they added a new button, right? I mean, they added a new label, a sticker, to show you here's the button, right? You know you have a discoverability problem when you find yourself later having to put stickers on things, right? Or explain things. One of the things that's interesting, you probably cannot see it uh, right here, but right there, it's actually a pic illustration of this button in the picture that's on the button, right? It's a little bit funny. So the fix to this would be to do something like this, right? Where I fix the, the button is big, but the sticker here is small. Let's make the, button, the sticker bigger. Let's build discoverability into it. Whoops, sorry. Let's do that. Gradient backgrounds. So here I've got two squares, A and B. And uh, I might put the colors up over here on the side, and you might agree with me. How many people think that the A and B feels, feels like it's the same as the, uh, as the others? You all know it's a trap. Almost nobody's raising their hands. This is a trap. Yeah, and several of you fell into my trap. Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, it's not. It's actually that. 
even I find, even when I'm looking at this slide, and I know the secret behind the trap, right? Even, even when I look at the slide right here, I'm seeing A and B up there and over here, and I'm telling they don't look the same to me. They don't. But they are. If I move these over, you can see they're exactly the same, right? So what's going on? Well, our eye senses a shadow right here. And it tells our brain that. And so our brain says, OK, I'm going to adjust what that color is. Because in the real world, that's how things work, right? In optical illusions, that not, that's not necessarily the case. But the cool thing about optical illusions is they provide insight into the shortcuts that our biology and our minds are, are, are taking on our behalf to, to give us a sense that the world is real. So here I've got a background, and I've got uh, kind of a darker circle and a lighter circle at the bottom here. And if you're thinking a trap awaits you, I, uh, you're right, I won't ask any questions. But if you, you agree with me that the one on top looks darker, I can do that, and then they probably look the same. In fact, I can verify it by bringing them down. All right. So here's some real software. Over on the left, I've got a sign-in button right here. And if you look at this sign-in button, it looks like it's a little blue here and a little greener here. Does anybody agree with that? It does, doesn't it? It does look like that. But if I move it up, you can see it's entirely one solid color. So gradients distort our ability to accurately perceive color. So as a result, the guideline is really be careful about using gradients as your background. There's one other problem on this page as well. And we're using a picture as the background for text. And I've got maybe some important text over here, right? Find the best doctors, uh, book instance appointments. But parts of it are white text on a light gray background. It's harder to read, right? So I also want to caution you against doing this, putting text on pictures. All right, polarity. So, there are two kinds of polarity, positive and negative. Um, positive polarity is black text on a white screen. And negative polarity is uh, white text on a black screen. And as developers, we often argue about which one of these is best. In fact, most developers I talk to prefer this one over here. But the question is, what's the actual, what is the best answer to this question, right? And so I researched this, and I looked, I, I, I went out to, to find the, uh, the benefits. And for positive polarity, one of the benefits is that your acuity, your visual acuity, increases. Meaning that you're able to see more data, right? And part of the reason your, your, your vision is sharper, okay? And part of the reason that happens is because the more light hitting the iris uh, constricts it. And so the vision is sharper. Um, and in tests they've done, customers perform better. They tend to do work faster in a, in a uh, positive polarity environment. And their reading accuracy goes up by about 26%. And because the pupil is, uh, is smaller, because, because the iris is smaller, um, the, uh, you can actually increase the data density, density by dropping the font size down, put more text on the page with positive polarity. These tests are irrespective. They have the same results regardless of how old you are or uh, what the ambient light conditions are. These tests have, yield the same results. Also, if you have, if have astigmatism, you get sharper vision. So those are the benefits of positive polarity. Uh, the benefits of negative polarity, oh wait, there's one more, shadows, right? Shadows are something we see in the world all the time. Well, I can, if I want to put a window up and it floats on something else, I can put a shadow behind it as a clue to the user that it's floating. I created software a while back that did create floating things without shadows. And one of the developers on my team said, Mark, should we put a shadow here? And I said, I don't know, let me create a mock-up. So I create a mock-up and I have the original and the new one side by side so I can look at them both, information in parallel. And I see the shadow and I realize, oh, we need a shadow for sure. We absolutely need one. It was not something that occurred to me at the beginning. So shadows are really good. You can do that in this world, but in this world, they're harder to do in negative polarity. Um, 
So there's some anecdotal evidence that it's preferred by users with cataracts. I've seen some people that say, I have cataracts and I like this better. I can work better. Um, and that's it. That's it. So when, when I look at these two, okay, the data seems to say positive polarity is the winner. But this may be a tough slide for you to look at if you're using you know, dark all the time and you think that's the, that's the way to go. Okay, but here we go. All right, wrapping up. I just want to check my time. I've actually got 10 minutes, I think. I was rushing through, but I think that's good because we'll have time for questions. Um, but uh, let's do this exercise right here. This is real UI that I found online, and I kind of want to talk about what's wrong with this. And I'm not sure if we have the ability to, do you guys think you have the ability to say, shout out anything that you think is wrong with this? So I can hear you. Gradient. So we've got a gradient background. The gradient background is tough. It's difficult. I totally agree with that. That totally stands out. If we were to get rid of the gradient, any other problems that you see on this? What? Contrast between text and background or between, yes, between data and background. The contrast seems low. I would agree with that as well, right? Um, let's take a look at what we get over here. And I made a few changes. And so this is my fix over here on the right. And what's cool about it is you can kind of side by side see and you say, oh, look, this is better. I've got contrast over here. There is, uh, I did keep the gradient, but I made the changes so small that it didn't really impact your ability to read this. <laughs> I also used this, uh, a more limited color set. And I changed all uppercase to lowercase. Uh, to mix case, I mean, right? Because there's some data that says uh, this is faster to read than that. Okay, so uppercase is generally not good as well. And so that is the change there. All right, what we've learned. Every element on screen, everything that you're presenting to people is uh, information. But not all information is equally important. Emphasis should match the importance of the element. And that's not only for contrast, but also for size. Right? Remember the iPhone, the control text was a little bigger than the discoverability text underneath. For readability, we need sufficient contrast when it's grayscale, also known as the perceived brightness spectrum. When it's grayscale, we need to be able to see it. Um, there is also uh, some online tools. There's a guideline, uh, uh, WCAG, WCAG I think is what it's called, the guidelines, um, uh, I think it's 4.0, and it, is, it talks about uh, contrast, minimum contrast ratios. And so there are online guidelines for that to see if your text on your website is sufficiently easy to read. Physical proximity, how close something is should match the contextual proximity, right? So if something is contextually related, closely related, it should be close together, right? Friends should be close and your enemies should be farther away. Borders should be thin or low contrast and no closer than uh, 1.5 times the space width unless you uh, uh, unless you lower the contrast or make it thinner. Okay. I think the problem is my head is so giant that these are like, no, I don't think so. All right, buttons should be filled. Unimportant buttons can be lower contrast, but I, uh, they should still be filled. If your button fill color is the same as your background color, uh, I would make the argument that that's wrong. Corners should be round, and important corners can be sharp. Contextually, information, contextually related information should be presented in parallel, right? Side by side is the easiest for our eyes to compare back and forth. Discoverability allows customers to learn how to use the interface. That's important. In fact, most often I see discoverability is the problem do people don't realize they have until the end. So if you want to create a new interface and you work through it, you say, this is very efficient, it's going to be the fastest way through. You get through it uh, at the end and you start showing it to customers and customers are like, how do I use it? 
then you realize you have a discoverability problem. And the advice is, at the beginning, when you're like, hey, we're going to create something new, also allocate time to solve the discoverability problem that you will inev inevitably have when you create something new. Gradient backgrounds distort our perception of color, and positive polarity is better, according to the data, than negative polarity. And that is it. And for people who want to take a picture of the screen, I'm going to just jump over to this side here. And, uh, and then the last thing I have here is, if you, where can I learn more? So if you go out to sgui.com, that stands for Science of Great UI, sgui.com, there are articles out there um, that I put out there, as well as a free email course that you can sign up for. And I also have a course over at deviq.com. And so that's uh, where you can learn more. And with that, uh, I am going to be open for questions. And so we can ask me anything you want, including things about your own projects. So we've got some time. Oh, they're right here. OK. What's the story behind the blue beard? So uh, my wife, is my wife somewhere nearby in here? Karen, are you out here? Looks like she is not. So my wife has got the colored hair in the back. Uh, she was in the, uh, we were in a, uh, she was getting her hair done. And she was getting it done teal and purple. And the uh, hairdresser said, hey, uh, would you like that? And I was like, OK, sure, why not? And so they did this. And then I was like, oh, I kind of like it, and uh, that's it. I've had it ever since, so about two years now, I think. So given your experience, what is your opinion of Google's material design? So I think in general, Google's got some, uh, some pretty, uh, in general, pretty good design uh, issues. Um, uh, so so uh, or pretty good design. Um, uh, and, and, and I should say, too, that, uh, oh, here's Karen right here. Karen, can you stand up, please, and show the, the, the awesome hair that you have in the background? Can we, I'm going to come over here so this gets on, because uh, the camera's following me. <laughs> and we're going to get this on the live stream if they're still doing that. That's what we're talking about right there. So, so yeah, I think in general, Google does some pretty good stuff. So if you look at Google, for example, and you go out and you look at, like, um, they will often have uh, the important button, the most common button, to be, like, blue and then next to it, a less common button to be like gray. They're still filling the buttons. The buttons are rounded, right? So it's following the guidelines. They have different colors for them, but that's okay because the important path is highlighted, right? The one they want to go. And so they're emphasizing with saturation, right? Saturation, color, is one of the ways I can emphasize. So they do that. So um, I think Google, in general, is, their, their stuff is, is, is pretty good. But I haven't seen mistakes from like Apple and from Microsoft. Right? Microsoft has been a fan recently of the hollow buttons with square corners, which I think are totally wrong. Um, Microsoft has also done stuff with thick borders uh, around buttons and tiny little icons inside, which I think is also totally wrong. Um, and I've, seen, I've also seen mistakes from, from Apple over the years. Um, so do the concepts you've shown apply for accessibility considerations like colorblind ones? Yes. They do. Can we make the UI practical for all users? Yes, we can. If you focus on uh, creating UI for, uh, to deal with accessibility issues, you end up getting a UI that's easier to use for people who do not have those issues, okay? Who are not handicapped or do not have, uh, who are not uh, disabled. So yes, absolutely, you can do that. Um, and one of the guidelines here, by the way, is don't use only color as an indicator. This is also a guideline I didn't talk about today, but I've seen this from time to time, where the only way to tell that something's on or off is by its color. And if you're doing that and that's the only way to do it, then it doesn't make it easier for everybody. It makes it harder. But if you, you do two things, you can use color as an indicator plus something else, then people can see and understand, right? So yes, uh, absolutely. They absolutely apply. And, and part of, and actually I want to stay on this question for a second. Um, part of the reason they also apply is because great design is ultimately about efficiency. It's efficiency of thought and efficiency of motion. That's it, right? So if I can reduce the motion in order to get a task done and reduce the thought, then in that case, I'm going to have better design, better UI than, than otherwise. 
Okay, um, I use a dark theme on my ID because I feel it's less light directly into my pupils and they get less tired. Did your test also include eye strain? Well, I didn't do the test. Um, I did see discussions about eye strain and the eye strain uh, conclusions were basically that you get just as much strain on the eyes both ways is what, uh, without any measurable difference. Um, the last time I looked at the data, it was uh, maybe about a, uh, less than a year ago. And so the data at that time said that. So, so no, eye strain is not a factor on it. How to handle texts on images. Okay, so for text on images, if the contrast is not sufficient, what I do is I put a background behind it. Uh, sometimes it's translucent, so, uh, so I can see through it a little bit. Uh, if it's a light image and I have white text, I'll make it a dark background. And then I'll blur the edges, I'll, I'll fuzz it out, right? Kind of like it looks like a, sh a blurry, uh, a fuzzy shadow behind it. And then the background doesn't call attention so, to itself with, dark, with sharp corners, right? Instead, we've got this, it's kind of a gradient of, of almost totally transparent to becoming less, uh, more and more opaque, becoming more and more opaque. That's how I'll do that. Handle, handle text on images, and that works really well. Okay, Corners made a comeback recently with sharp flat design, Windows 8. Is it retro, or is it cleaner than rounded corners? It's wrong. It is wrong, wrong, wrong. Rounded corners are better. There's nothing, it calls attention to the button. It calls attention to the edges. Sharp corners are good if you've got like an, if you've got a crowded visual field. And like you're, you're a, a product you want to put on, on a shelf and you want everybody to look at your product. In that case, you want to have like a banner that says, you know, save 20% or double the power or all new, right? A banner with sharp, sharp corners around it. But in general, in the UI that I'm using to be productive all the time, no, sharp corners do not make sense. It's not, I'm telling you it's wrong. It's not, it's not right. Mm -hmm. What is a good way to distinguish an important button from the other buttons? Well, I mentioned this already, um, saturation like Google does is a good way to do it, where the fill color of that button is, is, has color to it, has some color. Not a lot, just enough so you can see its color, right? It's, got, it's like a, a darker blue background, for example, than the others. And is that it? Are we out of time? And we are out of time, yes. Okay. Thank you All so right, much. Thanks for your questions. Thank you so much.